Hey everybody, meet Fred. Or I guess I should say more specifically, meet Freds. So these are six of the 11 Freds or free hard drives that I have for the TRS-80 Model 4 computers. I may not have mentioned it yet on the channel, but I was at the recycling center and I got not one, not two, not three, but four TRS-80 Model 4 computers that were being saved from the scrap bin. And for as much as I love the nostalgia of the old floppy disks and putting it in and turning the handle and hearing that little whir, uh, they are not reliable and they are very slow and they make the hobby of retro computing just that much more challenging. And for somebody like me who just doesn't have a whole lot of time, uh, it kind of takes away a little bit of the fun of it. So um, I use disks from time to time and that's all awesome. But um, whenever I get the opportunity, I go solid state. And thanks to the sponsor of this video, PCBWay.com, I was able to get not one, not two, but 11 of these Fred boards and build them up and start putting them in my Model 4 computers. And so um, these things, I have it sort of laid out like a little kit here. They use a couple different resistors. Uh, there's a couple headers here. We've got a 50 pin, it's basically a SCSI connector. It's a 50 pin ribbon cable. And uh, this board will give you a real time clock. It's got a PIC microcontroller, has an SD card slot. And the way the TRS-80s worked is that they had up to four floppy drives originally, but you could have a total of seven drives in any combination of floppy drives and hard drives. And so uh, the way this thing works is I have one floppy in there now, so it actually emulates six hard drives. So I sort of have six, I don't know, 20, 30 meg hard drives, which is just a ridiculous amount of space for the computers built in the early 80s. And uh, yeah, these things are awesome. Um, the one thing about this project, I am super appreciative of the people who built this thing and, and they honestly designed it, I think it's been almost 10 years ago. And uh, some of the documentation is a little hidden. Some of it is uh, a little hard to come by. So with these PCBs, I wanted to, instead of watching me solder, I wanted to go over a couple things that you need to know about these things. If you're interested in making your own, you can definitely go to PCBWay.com and get the boards. And like I said, 11 of them, maybe 20, 30 bucks. And the parts in these things are relatively cheap. This is a couple bucks. The, the most expensive part is the uh, PIC controller. And that cost me five bucks or maybe even a little bit less than that when I got them in bulk and just some other capacitors and stuff like that. You actually don't need a bunch of the things that are on the board. This does add a real-time clock. And if you're not interested in having a real-time clock, a lot of people don't use them. You can get rid of this, 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 get rid of some of the passives and all that kind of stuff. And if you're like me and you program it in an EEPROM programmer, you actually can get rid of some of the RS-232 stuff. And so there's, there's this board can really be stripped down to where it costs next to nothing to make. And that's what makes PCB Way so awesome. The fact that you can get, um, you know, the only place really selling them, I think you might be able to get them on eBay or directly from this guy named Ian. He's a really super nice guy, his site in Australia. Um, and they're like 75 bucks. So they're not very expensive, you know, if you go to buy them that way. And if you just have one computer and you want to support Ian, I strongly encourage you to do that. In fact, I'll even leave a link in the description for that. But if you've got a couple of computers or you have some friends that are in this stuff and you guys want to go in together, you know, you could build 10 of them for 150 bucks, something like that. So they're not very expensive. Um, the issues that I ran into was that there were a few different revisions of the build of materials for this thing. And they, uh, when you look at the board, you'll notice that the actual, like it says capacitor 10, but it doesn't tell you the value of that. So actually having the proper bill of materials with this thing is very important. And the zip file that I got had the wrong one listed. Um, so what I'm going to do and what I kind of feel like is my contribution to the community is I'm going to clean that stuff up and post it in the description of this video in my repository where you can get the PCBs for this. And I'll also have it as a shared project on PCBWay.com. Uh, you can get the proper bill of materials. You can get the proper instructions on this. And there's a few little things you need to do. Um, the story goes that I, I've heard different versions of what happened here, but the story goes that somebody was using a, uh, the guy who actually built this thing, I think his name is Fred, um, had a transistor here, a B170 or something like that, that had a different footprint. And, um, 
So the footprint on the board is wrong. And so the fact is the board actually doesn't need it. So if you'll notice what I did, I'm going to be giving this one to a friend as a kit. I soldered in, you don't need resistor 15. And all you have to do is jumper these two legs of the B170. So what I actually did is I went in here and I soldered that little jumper for him. And then I filled in this hole so you know nothing goes there. And I filled in these two holes so you know nothing goes there. And then everything else from that point on is going to line up with the instructions that I give you. When it comes down to it, soldering these things is not very complicating. You see every once in a while I leave a resistor all cattywampus. Um, the trickiest part by far is to solder the um, SD cards. I've done some micro SD cards since I've done these, and so I've started actually drag soldering these. I'll be demonstrating that in another video, how I actually put some flux down there and just drag across and solder them all more quickly. But um, this definitely works. I like to use pure um, or silver bearing solder on these. It's a little bit stronger and it uh, you know seems to be good for shoving in the SD cards and stuff like that. But um, for the most part, there's nothing other than this is very tricky. And this isn't too bad. If you get too much solder, you take it off. Um, but you've got a voltage regulator here. You've got some passive resistors. You've got your pick, a couple of chips. You don't have to socket them if you don't want to. I did. Um, one kind of cool tip is these little individual headers, which I guess I have them right here. One of the cool things about these headers is if you take two of these 40 pin headers that come out like this and you break them if you break it off to where you can do it perfectly for this socket you can actually take what's left over and you can make one of these sockets so two of these pin things will do the left side the right side and then these two sockets here so that's why those chips actually sit up a little taller you can actually use two headers to do four chips and then it just fits absolutely perfectly and then i bought a couple of extra sockets for these other things over here you also have a couple of different options depending on what uh, kind of enclosure you want to use i have some that the leds i don't have any here that are like that i have some where the leds are soldered onto the board and i have some that are set up with little headers so i can run them remotely um, it just takes five volts and ground in here and there's not really much to it uh, there are some very cool uh, enclosures on Thingiverse that I will go ahead and link to. And um, yeah, so basically what you do, you put it in there, you put a ribbon cable in there. I made the ribbon cable myself and uh, you use a boot disk. You could update a ROM so it'll just boot automatically, but use a boot disk is how I do it. I'm actually using a GoTech and all of a sudden you've got six hard drives on your Model 4. So let's check it out. Okay, so I've got a couple of these computers and I hook these things up different ways. This is an enclosure that came from Thingiverse and uh, you can, in this case, I put a blank one down here, but sort of this modular system. The problem is it it's real thin, it's real cheap, and it also needs uh, just a lot of fiddling. Like I wound up using the hot glue on there just to kind of align it because you want this stuff to align perfectly. And you can see there where the glue on the back kind of sucked that in a little bit. And in general, I mean, I love the idea that things are out there on Thingiverse, but um, you know, I got this one too. I printed this one, which is just kind of, it felt kind of cheap, but it also, these holes just didn't line up with my board. And uh, you know, that's really common on Thingiverse and even on this one, this hole, they made it so dang tight. I don't understand why people do this. They'll make a hole like this so tight that the SD card didn't actually fit through there if it's not just absolutely perfect. Um, and so what I decided to do was to go ahead and make my own enclosure, which I still need to put the LEDs in. But uh, I did something a little bit different. Instead, I just made a whole shelf here and I recognized that there might be some, you know, some variances in the board revisions as far as uh, where these holes are. There clearly are because they don't line up with a lot of the other enclosures that I found. And then also, you know, the SD card, it's real easy to shift it just a little bit and make it not fit. So what I decided to do was just give a little bit of room in there. You know, you don't have to build things down to the, the millimeter. You can give a little bit of room where you can modify that. And then what I did is this is, I mean, this is a chunky piece of plastic. Like this is, this is a no joke enclosure that I made. And my thought was that, um, you know, I'll just screw it right through the bottom. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you put the holes exactly where you want them. You get the thing exactly where you want it. I used, uh, used some machine screws up through the bottom and it is exactly what I want. And it's heavy duty. And when I'm pushing that SD card in there, it's not gonna be like this one that's all flexing and stuff like that. So um, what I did, I do have one of those, I do have that style for, um, the GoTech. So I have a GoTech in here. And the way I like to do this is I like to, um, it's really hard to get the drives in and out of the Model 4. So what I like to do is to use these kind of adapters to where the power of the 
unit is completely separate. So in other words, I can disconnect the power from the machine. And what I do is I just crimp on here to the five volts. This needs five volts. This uses a normal floppy cable. And then I'll go over here and I'll just crimp this over so that I can have these two things be a unit. I can put one on the top, one on the bottom, and uh, you know, completely disconnect the power to get this out of here. So um, that's basically what I do. I just rig up my own power connectors. Um, so again, just crimp on here onto an existing splitter, and I'll plug this where the old floppy drives are plugged in, and then this is just gonna be an extra one over here. Since we're talking floppy drives, I decided to go ahead and pull out. These are the original two Model 4 Gate Array floppy drives that I had. And uh, I think this is pretty cool. There's a, uh, what is it, 7406 chip. So, you know, this chip obviously went bad and some of the logic on this chip went bad. And somebody, uh, if you look here, somebody actually um, soldered another chip on top of that chip. And you can see this little bodge wire goes on a pin, skips a pin, over a pin, and solders in. And you can just see the way they just bodge that on there. And you know, I mean, back in the day, I mean, this drive was was expensive, but even back then, um, you know, it was just a, a substantial portion of someone's income to buy a drive. And so, you know, where today we would just throw something like this out, there were real technicians doing real things to make uh, this kind of bodge, and it probably cost them 30 cents in parts, and they were able to save the drive, which I just think that's just so cool, and that's just kind of a part of computer history. Ah, <laughs> here they are, my first two repaired Model 4s from the trash. We've got the Model 4D, we've got the regular Model 4 over here with the Fred hooked up and ready to go, so let's check it out. All right, this is the TRS-80 Model 4, and uh, we have got the Fred booted up, and we're going to scroll through here, and you can see that there's different operating systems you can go into. You can go into New DOS or CPM or LDOS, and uh, you can even boot into some of the Model 3 versions. So we're going to click that, and we're going to reboot, and now we have booted into LDOS. And what we're going to do is we're going to hit a DIR, and what's interesting about this thing is that... Um, you know, we think of floppy drives and hard drives, but the Model 4, you got a total of seven drives that you could use regardless of if they were floppy or hard drives. So the way this works is we have one of the drives is essentially the GoTek that's plugged in and is uh, booting the thing up right now. And then that leaves us room for six more drives. And so as we scroll through here, you're going to see there's a ton of files. Uh, this is drive zero. And then we're going to come through just so many things on drive zero. Then we've got drive one and we can keep going through drive two. And, you know, they're not all full, but there are um, seven places that we could put drives on there. And then you basically just use it like your existing Model 4. And I'm going to put in the game Heli, which is a game I've never really played before. And uh, so I'm going to, I think, uh, let's see, there's some instructions here. So we're going to hit the instructions thing and tells us to hit the space bar to drop some bombs. And you can move around. We have to destroy the gas tank. All right, let's give it a shot. Uh, we're going to start off in slow because I suck at games in general. But, oh, I got shot. They're shooting back at me. Oh, oh, oh. Oh goodness, I am not very good at this. So you can see that all of a sudden, no discs. The computer's completely silent. Um, you could actually hook up speakers if you wanted to on this thing, but uh, through the cassette port. But anyway, we've got this thing. Oh, gas tanker. Oh yes, I got some fuel. So anyway, um, it is just a very basic game that came uh, or that's available for the Model Three, I think. And so. Uh, I just think this thing makes this computer so much more useful. You can just copy the games over onto your SD card. You can copy your programs over there. It's silent. It boots well. You're not worried about corrupt disks and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that is the Fred.